Uh, my name is Omeya Biha, and I'm the project lead for the Zero Emission Vehicles Awareness Initiative. It's known as ZVI. This project is funded by NRCAN, Natural Resources Canada, and it's uh, due to close in March 2025. Now, the objective of this uh, the objective of this initiative is to raise awareness in rural, remote, indigenous, and farming communities, and also small businesses and transportation companies. Through this initiative, we aim to start a dialogue within these communities and organizations, and then through that, enable the adoption of zero emission, medium, and heavy duty vehicles. Before diving into this role, I worked as a senior business analyst at Amazon UK, where I honed my analytical skills and passion for driving impactful change. And today, I'm honored to moderate this session and guide our discussions on such an important topic. As this is my first moderating experience, I'm approaching it with, with enthusiasm and a willingness to learn, and also with the assumptions that any hiccups that I make today will be forgiven by all of you. Well, we hope this session is going to be insightful for all of you and engaging with your help and maybe a bit more fun. Thank you all for being here. And now let's power our revolution towards zero emission vehicles. We have a stellar lineup of speakers today, each bringing in a unique blend of expertise and passion to our discussions. And I'm excited for the valuable insights that they're going to be sharing with us today. I'm going to briefly introduce the agenda. The title of today's session is Zero Revolution, Unleashing the Future of Medium and Heavy Duty Fleets. OK, I guess I was too loud. This title suggests a revolution in the field of zero emission vehicles, emphasizing the transformative impact on medium and heavy duty fleets. The zero revolution term combines zero emission with a sense of groundbreaking change. Now, before we dive in, I'm going to quickly introduce our panel, Arjun Sharma, Megan Lohman, and Ted Dowling. Arjun, uh, we'll start with exploring um, the city of Edmonton's journey on the path to zero emission and climate resilience for medium and heavy duty fleets with electric, hydrogen, and dual fuel vehicles. And he'll also walk us through the learnings from the implementation of electric and hydrogen into their fleet, emerging technologies, how this incorporates within the fleet, and also COE's journey going forward. This will be followed by Megan from Community Energy Association. She'll be speaking to us about this the state of vehicle electrification in Alberta, including early adopters in the medium and heavy duty fleet sector and those leading in the field. We will also hear about the challenges and opportunities and ways that the local government and businesses and organizations can contribute to the transition to zero emission transportation. Our concluding speaker, who's sitting right on the other side of this room, is Ted from Ibasco. He will focus on the worldwide trend he will focus on the worldwide trends of heavy-duty bus fleet electrification, how and why some regions got it right, those who, are getting, those who are getting closer, and what Canada needs to get there faster. Post each of their individual presentations, we will then have all of the speakers up for panel discussion, followed by opening the floor to the audience for any questions that you have to the speakers. I'd like to begin with introducing our first speaker, Arjun Sharma. Arjun Sharma is the fleet management expert and sustainability advocate. He's the branch manager for fleet and facility services at City of Edmonton. Arjun Sharma has, um, is leading a staff of 1,200 members responsible for maintaining over 5,000 pieces of fleet and equipment over 700 facilities. The city of Edmonton has one of the biggest municipal fleets in the country and has committed to climate resilience through several initiatives, including the, including the implementation of battery electric, hybrid, and hydrogen vehicles, amongst other technologies. In addition to his role with the city of Edmonton, Arjun has also taught undergraduate classes in negotiation, managerial skill development, and organizational behavior at McEwen University in Edmonton. Please join me in welcoming Arjun to share his insights with us. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot. Um, Umi makes me sound a lot more impressive than I am, surely. Uh, I'll try not to put all of you to bed uh, today after lunch, but thanks for having me. Uh, before I get into my presentation, I just want to take a second uh, to share an outline acknowledgement, which is something that we do in the city of Edmonton prior to any of our presentations. So I'm an immigrant. I came from India when I was three years old, and I actually landed here in Calgary. And when I was a teenager, uh, like every immigrant, you hear these stories from your parents about how good it was back home and how much of a struggle it's been uh, making that journey to Canada. And I used to ask questions that I feel silly about asking now, like, hey, if things were so good, why, didn't, why did we come here? And I would get answers such as, we came here for safety, and we came here for opportunity. So I just want to you know, take that second to reflect and thank the Indigenous people whose lands that we walk on today for safety and that opportunity. Uh, City of Edmonton sits on Treaty 6 territory. I believe we're on Treaty 4 territory today. So just want to pay respects to the ancestors uh, uh, whose footsteps we follow in. With that, I'll get into my presentation. Um, so the City of Edmonton Fleet and Facility Services, we are one of the largest integrated fleets in all of North America. Uh, the reason being is that Org design is different across the board. In the city of Edmonton, we have fire, police, Alberta Health, Health Services, our, our parks and roads crew, uh, our bus fleet, all under one umbrella, making it one of the largest uh, fleet uh, fleets in all of North America. So it's made up of 5,000 vehicles and pieces of equipment, anything from lawnmowers to trailers to fire trucks to 60-foot buses, hydrogen buses, police cars, ambulances, you name it, they're all a part of our fleet. We also have uh, 700 facilities, and I think the facility uh, aspect is extremely important when we talk about our journey towards lower emission and zero emission as well. Understanding the infrastructure requirements that need to be in place for success um, in implementing lower emission vehicles. So I want to talk a little bit about our journey um, and being so some of the early adopters in zero emission vehicles and zero emission uh, fleet, specifically in the medium and heavy duty sectors. So the city of Edmonton uh, was really in terms of our strategy from council and our city's plan, wanting to meet the GHG emission reductions goals that were stated in 2016 under the Paris Agreement. Since then, we've you know had new legislation, new targets that have come in uh, at municipal levels, at federal levels, et cetera. And we thought one of the ways that we need to meet these targets was to move to a lower path in terms of emissions technology in owned fleet, but also widely in our society for our residents and folks that live in the city of Edmonton. One of the things that we was really, really important to us, and what we're, we're going to see, and I'll talk about a little bit on some future slides, is the operational impacts of moving to lower or zero emission technologies. And for that, we need to apply a lens of GBA plus or diversity and inclusion. So when you think about a single mother um, who needs to take the bus to drop her child off at daycare and get to work, do you think that single mother cares about the drive or propulsion system of that vehicle? Probably not. She probably cares more that that vehicle arrives on time and is able to do what needs to be done. The same thing for waste collection, the same thing for fixing our roads, transportation, etc. So we wanted to be mindful that as we move to zero and lower emission vehicles, that we keep operations at the forefront of our mindset. So where we started, we started in our bus fleet. Um, so the city of Edmonton was the first jurisdiction in Canada to commit to 60 battery electric vehicles. The reason we started in our bus fleet was that it's primarily a homogenous fleet. So when you think about uh, vehicles that we have, a sander is very different than a fire truck, which is very different than an ambulance. With our buses, uh, just under 1,000, uh, a majority of them were 40-foot buses which made it easy to segment. They're all parked in the same area, the same user group, the same type of work that is being done. So we really looked to move forward in that realm because we had one key competitive advantage, and that was that they were parked indoors. They were climate controlled. Um, a lot of folks here that are familiar with battery technology or other technologies understand that inclement weather, uh, sometimes in Edmonton, we're at minus 30, minus 40, uh, has a significant impact to battery life. And so this is where we wanted to start as an organization to start exploring zero emission vehicles. Why we went to battery electric? We did a feasibility study uh, a few years ago, and that feasibility study suggested that we start small. Uh, 
And now this is the nuance for municipal governments when we are trying to proof of concept and pilot technology. The recommendation from the administration a few years ago was that we bring in five battery electric buses. Uh, we put in the uh, infrastructure that's required to move those forward to do a, a longer term proof of concept and pilot program. Our council at the time said, screw five, let's do 60. And we, we said, okay, uh, we, you know, we are at the will of our elected officials. So we moved forward in a rapid, more rapid pace than we would have liked to, but with that, there was a ton of lessons learned. We saw the pros of technology, the, you know, the pros of being early adapters. Uh, we got to talk to a lot of municipalities, a lot of uh, you know, companies around the world uh, on our first purchase. We also were able to lead the charge in terms of infrastructure, working with utility companies, working with uh, construction companies, different charging infrastructure companies to make sure that our facilities were outfitted for success. And when we talk about success, and infrastructure, um, right now in the light duty field, it's easier to purchase vehicles, right? I can buy Teslas, I can buy Ford F-150, Lightnings, etc. I can't charge them. And so this is an intricacy when it, we talk about operations. If I were to buy 30 F-150 electrics tomorrow, our utility provider has been very clear to me that hey, Arjun, in these specific sites in the city of Edmonton, you can park them and charge them. Whereas in these ones, you would not be able to park all 30 in the same location or charge at the same time. Now for operations, that makes a bit of a, a conundrum because generally our vehicles are out from 7 a.m. to about 7 or 8, 9 p.m. and they want to be charged overnight. So it's really figuring out a short, medium and long-term strategy for success in implementation with the nuances of infrastructure. So when we look at our journey towards zero emissions vehicles, it's really a path forward, and we don't want to be prescriptive when it comes to outcomes. I am looking at a variety of different technologies to reduce our carbon footprint today and into the future. Some of the things that we don't talk about because it's not as sexy as bringing in a zero emission vehicle, et cetera, are other things that you can do to be greener today. So one of the things that we're doing is we're right-sizing our vehicles. If somebody has a Ford F-350 or a full-ton truck, we're doing a deeper dive and saying, hey, could you go with a smaller SUV? Could you go with a smaller truck? That is a way for municipalities or larger fleets immediately to lower their carbon intensity. We also have the ability to look at different electric options, whether they be plug-in hybrids, full battery electric vehicles, um, or your traditional hybrid vehicle. And these studies are starting to emerge now in regards to the pros and cons of all of these technologies. We know that in cold weather climates are range limitations of battery electric um, in light duty, medium duty, and heavy duty. That being said, there's a ton of research that's coming on for shorter routes that it is almost optimal to go to a battery vehicle as opposed to something like a hydrogen vehicle, which may lack infrastructure uh, for longer haul trips, if that makes sense. There's a pretty cool study by Toyota that came out uh, in, in June or July of last year, where they talked about how carbon intensive it is for mining for batteries. And what Toyota suggested in that study was that the number of raw materials that go into one long range EV could power 70 hybrids. And those 70 hybrids actually have a 37 times greater impact on carbon intensity. So this future is continuing to evolve. That being said, I'm not against battery technology at any means. It is from five years ago to, to what it is today, to what it's gonna be five years from now, is just, you know, it's a walk along a linear line of efficiency, getting better and learning from, you know, uh, industry and other partners that are using it. We're also really big into hydrogen. We're probably the leaders in North America in terms of where our hydrogen program is at. We have a hydrogen fuel cell, two hydrogen fuel cell buses that we've brought in for testing that uh, take compressed hydrogen. We are also really excited about a dual fuel program uh, that's moving forward. So what dual fuel technology is, and I might have a slide a little bit later, but it actually injects hydrogen into your traditional diesel vehicle. And, and it's cool because it sits, and I'm gonna get fleet nerdy here, I'm sorry, but it sits on top of your engine manifold and directly puts hydrogen into the different cylinders at different frequencies. And in paper theory, you should be able to reduce emissions by 30 to 80 percent. So those vehicles are going to be on the road. We're going to have two buses and two waste trucks at the end of quarter one this year. And we're really excited about that program because that now allows us to retrofit 
existing infrastructure. The billions of dollars of vehicles that we have are not garbage and we're bringing in new vehicles. We can start retrofitting and making a difference in terms of climate impact today. And lastly, we're also looking at other emerging technologies. So Porsche last year, and it's available today in South America and some parts of Europe, they have a 100% renewable gasoline product that's taken from carbon capture, from carbon in the atmosphere. So we want to make sure that we're not being prescriptive of what that long-term outcome would be. 20 years ago, if I stood in front of you and talked about electric vehicles, I'd probably be laughed at. And five years ago, if I talked about hydrogen vehicles, I'd be laughed at. Maybe 10 or 15 years from now, we'll be talking about solar-powered vehicles or hydrogen fission or something else. So it's always good to keep on cusp of the technology and not get too far ahead of yourself. So we really want to move forward with an approach of curiosity, testing, and science. So I'll talk a little bit about what produces success in these type of programs in terms of investment. So we have our Alberta Zero Emissions Hydrogen uh, Transit Program, AZ for short. And there's been a lot of folks that have come together to see this project off the ground. It's led by the city of Edmonton, but we're also working with the Transition Accelerator. Suncor, which is known to be an oil and gas, but they're producing their hydrogen for us um, in, in a clean way. Um, Edmonton Transit, Strathcona County, which is a neighboring municipality. We're also working with Rome Transit in Banff and Jasper to bring in two buses that are new fire buses with powered by Ballard fuel cells to test them in our cold weather climates. And so far the tests have been pretty encouraging in terms of what the vehicle can do, but there's lessons learned like with any technology. We're finding out that the clarity of the hydrogen that you put in is so critical to success. Otherwise the fuel cell starts shutting off. We're finding out that hydrogen infrastructure is new. So sometimes hydrogen is not available today to, to refuel that bus like you would. But there's a lot of learnings and a lot of data. And what we've done is we've actually collaborated with the uh, University of Alberta and other academic institutions to help us on this journey to do testing, get the data, and make sure we're able to make decisions rooted in science and quantitative facts as opposed to opinion. So when we look at fleet conversion, we have hopes um, for our, our bus fleet, so that's a, our heavy duty fleet, to look at converting up to 440 vehicles over the next four to six years. This is really exciting. We have very aged assets that are up for renewal, and our council is gonna be able to make a decision on whether or not they wanna replace those vehicles like for like, so like for like would be diesels for diesels, or do we want to move forward and start looking at the possibility of replacing a large chunk of these vehicles with zero emission vehicles, whether they be battery electric, uh, hydrogen, or, or something else. And so because of that, we need to make sure that our infrastructure is able to support the vehicles that we bring in. Now, in the back of the room, you probably can't see this slide, but really what it talks about is when you start bringing in different types of vehicles, the impacts it has on operations. When we retrofitted our bus bay to be able to work on hydrogen vehicles, guess how many regulations existed? Zero. Nothing. We are creating and pioneering the regulations that are required for having these vehicles stored and worked on in your facilities. This is a big undertaking because now you have compressed hydrogen coming indoors. So with battery electric vehicles, some of the infrastructure considerations is how many megawatts of power is going into the facility? How are you storing power within the facility? How are you charging buses? With hydrogen or compressed natural gas, it's totally different infrastructure. It's do you have blast walls in place? Do you have uh, detectors in place to detect leaks? What happens if there is a leak? What happens if there's an open flame or spark? In some of these facilities, we're also welding across. Uh, literally 50 feet away, we're, we're welding or we're doing other types of operations. Uh, and so what does that mean for infrastructure? And what we've decided to do in the city of Edmonton and we're really excited about is our new transit garage is going to be our swing garage. And that facility is going to have the ability to house hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, electric battery electric vehicles, as well as your traditional diesel vehicle, all in one facility. What that's going to prepare us for is through proof of concept, through pilot, is the next facility that goes live that's going to be zero emission only by 2050. We're going to have a lot of lessons learned as to how to correctly design and retrofit our facilities. In terms of seizing the opportunity, now is the time. 
There is so much dialogue. There are so many grant programs that are available. There are so many partnership programs that are available to start looking at organizations, large or small, on how to reduce your carbon footprint. There's been more investment in the last couple of years from the provincial government, from municipalities, the federal government, and really around the world around reducing our infrastructure and cost of entry barriers for battery electric vehicles. And so it's a really, really important time for jurisdictions to think about how can they leverage in a fiscally responsible way all of these grants or funding opportunities or partnership opportunities that now exist. One of the things that we did, and this is why we have to be so nimble, is last year we went out for a hydrogen fueling station RFP. Now this request for proposal was unique because we were going to have it fenced off with 50% of the production going to the city of Edmonton and the buses that we were going to be bringing in and the other 50% going to private sector where they would be allowed to use hydrogen at one of our garages. So we went almost all the way through the RFP process. We got to council with our order of 40 hydrogen buses. There was no money. They said scratch that order. So alternatively we had to scratch the permanent fueling station. That doesn't mean we stopped. So now we're working with the Emissions Reductions Alberta and the feds to bring in temporary fueling stations, saying, hey, we still want to move forward with hyd hydrogen. What are the options that we have available to us? And here's where things get really interesting. When you think about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, it's still an electric bus. Sure, it's called a, a hydrogen bus. It's still an electric bus. All of the drivetrain components, everything is electric on that vehicle. But what happens is your store of energy is now in hydrogen as opposed to electricity. Your hydrogen goes through a fuel cell, generates electricity, drives the bus forward. But now if we think about that concept and scale up, imagine you have a larger fuel cell. And in your parking lot, you had compressed hydrogen. Now you have the ability to run that compressed hydrogen through a fuel cell to generate electricity for electric vehicles, but also put it directly into vehicles. And that's something that we're really, really interested in exploring over the next couple of years. In terms of our fleet, wide variety of electric vehicles in our fleet, anywhere from lawnmowers to buses to police cars. You see a, a couple of F-150 Lightnings in that picture. We have hydrogen, the buses that I talked about. We're also going to be purchasing 100 Toyota Mirai, which is a full uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, light duty vehicle that you can see right over there within the region. Six are arriving within the next couple of months for the city of Edmonton. Uh, we have a ton of hybrid vehicles and, and we're also moving forward with the dual fuel technology that I talked about on a couple of buses and uh, waste trucks. So by the numbers, uh, I'll talk about dual fuel technology really quick. So uh, this is Alberta, it's homegrown which is really exciting. So generally how this technology exists, and it's not new, it's probably a couple of decades old, is generally they would input hydrogen into the air intake, which is here, okay? What that did is the hydrogen burned up usually in the first couple of pistons. So it wasn't evenly distributed across the engine. Did you get some efficiencies? Yes, but you had the engine cooling and heating at uneven times. What a local company in Edmonton, and they've expanded to Calgary and Alberta have done, they've created an engine manifold that actually goes over the complete engine. Regardless of if it's Volvo or Cummins or Freightliner, you name it, this injects hydrogen directly into the pistons at different frequencies. And the reason we've selected to do a proof of concept on two buses and two waste trucks is we want to know the difference in frequency and timing of hydrogen in a start and stop application. So that's your bus, right? You go a couple hundred meters, you stop, you let passengers on and off, versus a highway application where those waste trucks are driving to the dump, which is out of town and back. So we're really excited about the initial results. Diversified and others have already implemented this technology, and they are seeing significant reductions in terms of tailpipe emissions and better benefits for your buck on diesel. So with that, the last thing I'll talk about before we get into the numbers is driver behavior. This is probably the easiest low-hanging fruit for fleets to fix to reduce their carbon footprint. Are your vehicles idling too much? Are they on for eight hours a day when they don't need to be? Are your operators accelerating really harshly, braking really harshly? Do you have those eco modes on in your vehicles? These little things from a driver behavior and a fleet management perspective make a huge difference when it comes um, 
to how much carbon you're using. So we were able to save about a million dollars a year in gasoline and diesel costs just by implementing a program around driver, driver awareness, anti-idling, and less harsh acceleration. So this is also a piece to the puzzle as we move towards a lower emissions future. Uh, lastly, in terms of uh, what we have today, uh, not what we have on order, but what's actually on the ground today, we have 161 hybrid units. Uh, of those, uh, 100 are police units. Every police unit that we're buying in that is available with hybrid technology, we're buying with hybrid technology. And the path forward for the city of Edmonton is I really want to have a roadmap, a strategic roadmap, saying, hey, by year X, 20XX, we will buy only a hybrid or battery electric or hydrogen solution if it's available. And later on, when we have to go to zero emission, we want to make sure we're positioned for success to be able to implement that. We have about 300 pieces of equipment that are fully electric, and we have six um, uh, units in the metropolitan region that are powered by hydrogen. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. I, I thank you, and if you have any specific questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. If not, we'll go to the next speaker. I see a question in the back. Go ahead. It's blue hydrogen, correct. Oh. But I mean, I can talk a little bit more about that narrative. Um, okay, I, I'm not. I'm not going to get too nerdy on you guys, but I'll talk about hydrogen generation. Generally, hydrogen already exists. You're just extracting it from something else. Many ways to do that. You have electrolyzation, which is green hydrogen, where you're generally pulling it out of water or pulling it out of you know, green ethanol, et cetera. That requires generally an energy input to create that hydrogen. With blue hydrogen, you're creating it primarily from natural gas. Now, the province and the oil and gas sector, because it's so important to Edmonton, Calgary, and to all of Alberta and Canada, really are pushing for blue hydrogen. Is it as green? Absolutely not. But is green hydrogen able to meet the demand capabilities we would be required to for 400 buses? No. So I, I don't want this to be a stop in terms of our progress because perfection is the enemy of progress. And so for me, moving forward, blue hydrogen, 20 years ago we were powering our homes with coal-fired power plants. We're not doing that anymore today. So for me, I want to continue to advance hydrogen infrastructure because I know hydrogen and the production of hydrogen is only going to get greener and greener. Make sense? Any other questions specifically for me before we go to the... Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to answer questions as a panel here moving forward, and I'm going to hand it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Arjun. City of Edmonton's journey towards the technological advancement in medium and heavy duty fleets is truly commendable. We wish you the best with everything that's coming forward. It's, it's, it's exciting. Well, moving on, we have um, Macon. Macon Logman is a climate and energy leader and a collaboration advocate. She is the acting CEO of Community Energy Association. She's been working in the field of climate energy for 20 years, engaging with local government, industry, public, and indigenous communities on innovative local solutions to support the transition to low carbon communities. She's passionate about designing and implementing high impact initiatives through effective collaboration between the public and private sectors. Megan is the acting CEO for the Community Energy Association and in her position has facilitated impactful projects in the transportation, building and waste sectors, including the award-winning Rural Electric Vehicle Network Development. She has been involved with the Energy Futures Lab in Alberta for four years and sits as a vice chair for Electric Mobility Canada. Please join me in welcoming Megan to share her insights with us. Yours. Hello. All right. I think I have to pick up the pace. 
<laughs> a little bit. So um, I, our organization, we're a, a charitable nonprofit working across Western Canada and a little bit in the East as well um, in Ontario, supporting local governments, communities, Indigenous uh, communities as well um, in the areas of climate and energy, um, really focusing in on those bold actions. So how can we um, help communities plan and implement ideally at a scale that can be replicated um, and uh, scaled at, in a regional or provincial way. Um, we work across all sectors of built environment, waste, and transportation. Um, today, the context, of course, that I'm here on is the development of uh, electric vehicle networks and um, progressing toward uh, adoption of electric vehicles across the spectrum. This is just a quick snapshot of the work that we have done as an organization. All of the dots and lines are networks that we have um, helped local governments, regional governments, and indigenous communities uh, install. And the purple one is in progress right now, shovel ready. We just need Need another 2.5 million so dig deep and let me know after if you can help um, our first network was in uh, southeast uh, British Columbia to connect the drivable markets of um, Calgary and Vancouver across an area that was devoid of EV charging infrastructure at the time so um, that led to southern Alberta knocking on the door and saying help us we want to connect to we have tourists that go across that region and then to the north so the message here really is that in my mind, to be able to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles, whether it is um, you know, personal use or when we get into medium heavy duty, it's going to have to be at a regional, if not provincial context that we're looking at the planning of that infrastructure. Um, we do work with Indigenous communities in all of the sectors that I mentioned, um, but around electric vehicles, it is a lot of identifying opportunities to bring economic development and tourism to communities, whether it's co-locating with a gas station or a, a casino, um, and it's something that our organization is very much committed to. Um, just a quick example of Indigenous leadership in this sector in Alberta. Uh, this is a photo of the opening of a fast charger at the Kananaskis Travel Centre, uh, which is owned by by Bears Paw Nation. We opened that, does it say? Yeah, 2019. It was the first uh, infrastructure installed in partnership with an Indigenous community. <clears throat> um, they've gone on to, the Stony Nakoda Nation has gone on to develop some communications. I was hoping we might have time to play YouTube, but we don't. It's only 30 seconds, but if you Google Stony Dakota electric vehicles, they have an awesome little clip about the application of electric vehicles in their own community context. And they have one image of horses riding in a field, and it says, we used to ride zero emissions with EVs, we still can. And I just love that because it's a connection back to the original way that they used to to move across the land. Um, there's all sorts of other climate leadership more generally across the province. Um, and I'd point to Kainai First Nation as one of those leaders as part of the Blood Tribe work across both uh, Canada and Montana. Okay, some quick grounding context when it comes to both um, uh, personal vehicles and uh, medium heavy duty at the national and provincial scale. And I'm talking in the Alberta context when I say provincial because it's um, an underdog in Canada that doesn't get the recognition I think it deserves, obviously the leadership that Edmonton has shown, but private sector as well. Um, national context, so medium and heavy duty vehicles total about a 27% of our transportation um, and 6% uh, of Canada's total emissions. Uh, the feds have established a target that 35% of new medium and heavy duty vehicles must be zero emissions by 2030. And then a secondary target of 100% um, by 2040 for a subset of vehicles based on feasibility. So there's a little caveat there for those hard to electrify um, vehicles that uh, that we've noted already today. And I just wanted to point out that California is ending the sales of convention combustion engine trucks by 2026. So among all of this, a pretty big market signal um, globally, I would say, from North America. Um, just wanted to demonstrate the models that are available, and Ted will certainly dig deeper in this in terms of uh, market availability. This is for North um, or for US and Canada um, altogether, and basically to demonstrate that even just over the last three years, incremental growth on um, the, the models that we're seeing available. Getting to the Alberta context, um, we actually have 
I should have mentioned, I am from BC, <laughs> but I say we because I have an affinity <laughs> for Alberta and the innovation here. Um, so Alberta does have a high rate of EV adoption um, in comparison to provinces that do not and have not ever had incentives. So of course you probably know that BC, Ontario, Quebec have had vehicle incentives for a long time. Obviously, the adoption of vehicles in those provinces is very high, much higher than Alberta. But when you compare Alberta to those that haven't, and even a few that have, including PEI, the adoption rate is um, the highest among those. Um, vehicle sales over 2022 uh, for passenger vehicles for um, battery electric uh, rose by 63.7% over that year. It is growing rapidly. The total percent of battery electric, plug-in hybrid, hybrid vehicles um, in all market sale uh, for that year was 1.2%. So charging infrastructure, um, I mentioned that this is a passion area for our organization. Obviously you can see along the Trans-Canada Highway lots of opportunity to stop and charge your car. Once you start to get you know into the more rural areas, that uh, connectivity gets a little bleak. This is from an app or a website called PlugShare.com. You can look at charging infrastructure globally on that app. Um, scroll around the world and, and check it out. What's interesting in terms of the adoption of electric vehicles, and this is whoop, from ATCO, is that where we have been able to um, install EV charging infrastructure in a really dedicated way, we've seen accelerated growth. This compares um, this compares uh, the, the rate of the percentage change between 2022 and 2023. It's really interesting. I mean, I think there were zero up there before, so the change, uh, you know, is relative. <laughs> but um, in 2023, this is what we've got. And of course, around urban centers, we've got a higher adoption of electric vehicles. So I'm going to flip over to the medium duty, heavy duty uh, vehicle space and give you a few leadership examples across um, across uh, Alberta, but I'll just start with this. This is not in Alberta, but just again, another example of signaling a market shift. Um, Canada Post has committed to 100% electric uh, delivery vehicles by 2040, 50% by 2030. They have 14,000 vehicles across the country. <laughs> that is 7,000 vehicles within the next um, six years, the supply of which will be interesting because they're not the only ones, of course, that have made that commitment. Uh, here in Calgary, NMAX has uh, two custom-built trucks that are on the road now. They're the f they were the first utility in Canada um, to deploy these, um, and they want to go fully electric in their fleet by 2030. Driving Force is a rental company also available here in Alberta. Um, they've got electric rentals. This is a Lion 6 um, truck. They've got cargo vans, Ford Transit. You can rent those today um, in this province. Parkland County, just west of Edmonton, was the first school district to adopt um, electric buses or an electric bus in 2017. Um, St. Albert adopting 15 electric school buses. Um, Speaking of which, also has, uh, as part of their fleet, they were the first municipal fleet to adopt electric uh, buses in 2017. Some early lessons learned on the operations and maintenance of that fleet, which Ted can get into if you uh, are interested or not. <laughs> um, but uh, what they found is that uh, these buses are producing 51% less uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Kind of a fun one. This has gone wild in Alberta. Tran converting um, to electric uh, Zambonis has become a big thing thanks to the funding from MCCAC. Um, here we've got Grand Prairie, Brooks, Leduc, and Didsbury that have all uh, converted their uh, Zambonis. Um, Coldale, Medicine Hat, there's a whole bunch of them that have found that this is a benefit not only from an operations perspective, but health and safety, frankly. Um, burning a fuel inside an enclosed uh, building is, I don't know why we still do that. Um, an interesting one out of uh, British Columbia, just north of Kamloops, this is the New Afton Gold Mine. This is the Sandvik LH518B uh, <laughs> um, loader that's used in their underground mining facility. It is 100% electric and uses battery swapping technology. So they don't have to wait for a recharge time. They actually have an automated uh, swapping of a battery that would be um, kind of pre-filled, ready to go uh, at the end of this uh, truck shift. 
They've also got this 100% um, electric uh, truck that, um, uh, let me see, sorry, I had the stat here. Oh, yeah, by replacing one of these to electric, they, at full um, operations, reduces the overall greenhouse gas emissions of this mine by 2%. That is how much diesel this thing uses, or not this, because this is electric, but what a traditional one would. And that just demonstrates every step does matter. That's a huge amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, tech. Uh, uh, converted all of their shuttle buses from the community of Elkford um, up to the mines with electric. And this was a really cool opportunity for the bus operator. Uh, they went down to California, got trained, were super skeptical about the whole thing. <laughs> they now uh, love it. The operational cost of the bus fleet is about um, 50 to 60 percent lower than um, operation and maintenance, I should say, uh, 50 to 60 percent lower than their traditional buses that they were using. And the miners love it. It's quiet. Um, one more example here with a different fuel. This is a fuel cell EV. This truck just completed on February tw or January 26th, just a couple of weeks ago, a round trip Edmonton to Calgary. It was a huge success. Um, it took place at a minus 11 day. There was not a loaded trailer. That's the next um, trip that they'll be taking. But this is a pilot <coughs> project with the Alberta Motor Transport um, Association. Um, you can find out more information about their ZEV AI, um, AI uh, initiative. Um, really interesting application as, um, as we heard about uh, with Edmonton. But what they have found is this return to base type trip where you um, have a centralized fueling station. It's very expensive, of course. Um, this is a, an application that they really want to expand on with the Nikola truck. Um, so I won't dwell on this. I think uh, Ted might um, speak a little bit more to this, but of course cost is going to be um, a consistent hurdle. <laughs> um, but as you've heard operationally and, and maintenance wise, um, significant savings to be had. We really need dedicated fleet charging, um, especially for medium duty. I have been stuck at the Electrify Canada, Deerfoot City charging bank waiting for the whole fleet of Amazon delivery trucks to charge there at a public charging <laughs> spot. And that uh, is incredibly frustrating as a, as a driver. Um, so making sure that we are educating and en en engaging our um, uh, businesses within our communities. Um, I want to be able to show you the, the um, grants that are available right now. Um, all of these, there's lots more information online, of course, but um, these are all available nationally. We do not have um, EV uh, grants or rebates available in the province of Alberta, and I don't suspect that we will um, in the near future. So um, we do rely on you know other mechanisms like uh, organizations, arm's length, of course, ERA and MCCAC have both um, been great partners in enabling funding in this province. Um, but these are great uh, federally um, available opportunities. And I'm going to stop there with the launch of our Peaks to Prairies uh, event down in Lethbridge in 2017, hosted by Lethbridge College, where they have got a workforce transition initiative in place. Um, and we were able to showcase early EVs. This was very early when <laughs> we were slugging a, a bolt um, along the road to get there. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, there's one. Um, this one there. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, Sindhu's just coming there with the mic. Oh, thank you, Sindhu. I'll make it quick, I promise. Um, just on the cost question, I'm, I'm really curious because there's always that chicken and egg story, right? That you need charging infrastructure to bring in vehicle and you need vehicle to kind of justify the charging infrastructure that's there. So <clears throat> is there like on the medium and heavy duty side some solutions that are already being explored? Because I think from, from what I've read, like for a hydrogen station, it can range up to a million bucks of CapEx. So if you're deploying medium and heavy duty, is it 
is it better to do it in a hub section where you have a bunch of chargers at the same place? Uh, is there different business models that can kind of be put in place to, to reduce the capex and ensure that there's a kind of an up curve in the business interest in, in deploying charging infrastructure? Yeah. Well, like Arjun was mentioning, there's also limitations on location, right? Your your first stop is your electrical uh, provider wire company to understand what the capacity is on the grid. So we even do this with a little fast charger comparatively to the, uh, the bigger um, charging infrastructure because most transformers, if you're in an urban center, are going to be tapped out, need a, um, or you need to extend, uh, which comes at great cost as well. So, um, location is key for sure. But I know, like transit um, operations would do hub style charging. Um, you know, Vancouver has the top down charging for their buses. I don't know the technical term for it. Yeah, you guys do too. So obviously, you can't just randomly put that on a you know street corner um, like you can. A, a public charging station, so dedicated design for hub charging, um, key for sure. I don't know if anyone wants to expand on that. Okay, okay. Ted will expand more. Great. I know I'm going to stick with in my presentation. So. <laughs> sure. But um, thank you for that, Megan. Um, you know, the Community Energy Association, Megan's organization, has worked with over 200 local government and indigenous communities, and your presentation just uh, does justice to that great work that you've done, Megan. Um, at this point of time, now that we have um, a good number of participants here, by a show of hands, can you, um, can you all tell me how many of you own or drive a zero emission vehicle? Two. <laughs> no, a, a car. <laughs> Two, three, four. Do I see a five? No? Okay, that's four people. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, how many of you want to buy a zero emission vehicle but are unable to do it because um, it's unaffordable or because there aren't enough grants? Okay, that's a, a decent number. Okay, well, not bad. Um, so we do have some interest in this room. What, uh, we just wanted to have uh, an understanding of what kind of participation here is uh, present in this room. Well, thank you. Um, all right, now with that, I'd like to move on and introduce Ted Dowling, who is an electric vehicle industry veteran. Ted is the managing director of North America at Ibasco. He's a Canadian executive in the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle space and has spent over 35 years working with teams, building companies, servicing public transit throughout the world. Ted has served on numerous boards of non-profit organizations and is currently on the Electric Mobility Canada board, a member of their Government Relations Committee and medium and heavy duty electric vehicle working group. Ted is a frequent speaker at international conferences on the topics of mass development of electric fleets, heavy duty vehicle electrification and the need for better, more cost effective infrastructure. He also has international experience spearheading the acquisition of technology from abroad and extensive involvement in setting up joint ventures in countries such as Asia, Europe, and Australia. In 2020, Ted was named to the Canadian Lacrosse Hall of Fame. Please join me in welcoming Ted to share his insights with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Where's that? Thank you very much. I'm Ted Dowling, the Managing Director for eBusco North America, basically in charge of bringing our European product over here, homologating it, and then eventually building it in uh, Canada. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to step back, look at the 1950s, what happened. Um, the unrevolution, I'll call it, is the uh, General Motors and a few other companies got together and they purchased all of the trolley um, bus fleets, or tro sorry, tro trolley um, track fleets from the big cities, Philadelphia, for example, there was an investment of $36 million to 1,000 buses. That's $36,000 a bus. So a lot less than what it costs today. But what they did was they went in, they replaced all the buses, all the um, trolleys with buses because it was less expensive to buy and replace than it was to maintain the tracks and all the trolley systems that they had there. Now, there are some that say it was a conspiracy that General Motors and Standard Oil and Goodyear got together to sell buses, tires, and, and fuel. So that you can read about that. You can Google it. So jump to the 2010s and look at some examples of where cities got it right. Um, and this is a really another good example of a, of an, a bus builder 
doing this with a city. So Shenzhen started in 2020, uh, sorry, 2012, and they bought a small order of buses, to just 2,000 to start. And uh, by, by 2019, it's 17,000 buses completely electrified, 14,000 taxis, 20,000 medium duty trucks. They were all charged by plug-in charging. So there was no overhead charging. They were just basically plug in, charge, and then use it the next day. Um, the incentive here was they had the incentives to do it by the Chinese government, but also the policy change that was later implemented by the Guangdong province to be all zero emission. So if you look at Europe, why is Europe, Europe being successful in this region? A lot of the operators in Europe are private operators, so for profit. They, when they buy a bus, they want to make sure the total cost of ownership is included from the start when they purchase the bus all the way through to what it costs when they retire it. They need to know they're making money on their, on their vehicle. Um, large cities have developed their zero emission zones, so a regular diesel bus cannot go into those zones, so you have to be zero emission, and that includes no, no diesel heater on the bus either. So this led to the mandate, which was recently announced, 100% zero emission buses by 2035 with 90% by 2030. That's a very ambitious goal. And also there's a lot more competition in, uh, in Europe. We have about 20 different bus builders that can sell into Europe right now. In Canada, you'll see later, we only have two. It's a very open market. What I mean by open market is when a, a specification or a bid comes out for a bus, it says, this is the criteria we need you to meet, these are the object objectives, and please bid on it. It's a little bit different than here, which I'll get into later. Another thing with the Europeans, um, the standards they have there is almost all the charging is exactly the same. It's, it's panograph up. Now, we've decided to, to standardize on panograph down here. Um, this panograph up and then CC2, CCS2 plug-in. So it's all the same. Every bus manufacturer has the same equipment. Um, every operator has the same equipment. It basically deliver a bus, whether it's, operate, whether it's built by man or Iveco or Ibusco, it's the same charging standards. And they utilize their buses a lot differently than the Europeans do. So a high uh, zero emission bus utilization, so over 600 kilometers a day, you can see in this graph here, what happens is they, they take the bus out, it goes into service for six hours, it comes back in, charges for an hour, and then goes back, back out for six hours. It, they operate it much like an aircraft, where it comes in, gets serviced, goes back out. Um, so again, the more operating time means more profit for that for-profit organization. Um, they also have man manufacturing contracts, or maintenance contracts, sorry, with the manufacturer. Very similar to the first two examples of the General Motors and then with uh, Shenzhen with BYD. This is the same thing. We have contracts with our customers now where we maintain the buses as well. And we also have partnerships with the local utilities. Just recently, there was an announcement that uh, one of the one of our customers uh, had uh, they basically said they they have too much power where they had at their facility because they're not using as much as they thought they would. So they're giving that now back to the utility. And also in Europe, it's a green grid where a lot of the places we're getting power from are the um, windmills, turbines, and the um, uh, we're also getting it from nuclear. So you look at the, where we are in Canada today, 6,000 of our 17,000 buses, same size as Shenzhen, um, have over you know, EPA engines that are 2007 and older. They emit almost 30 times what's allowed today from engines. The reason why they're, they're there is because they're still they're cheaper to operate, but they do break down more often. <coughs> so we have a low, um, say a low zero emission bus ut utilization. So under 200 kilometers a day in a lot, a lot of cases. We also have a, a mixed bag of uh, the charging. We have panograph down fast charging, panograph down slow charging. We have ch plug-in charging from the ceiling, plug-in charging from the ground. And we also have inductive charging. So a lot of things we have to deal with as far as bringing new vehicles here. And we also have a lack of zero emission bus builders. We only have no bus in New Flyer. And now with New Flyer being one of the only game, or one of the only two builders in the US, they're concentrating on the US market. So I was missing my, my graph here. But um, yeah, so it, but it's optimistic forecast for electric buses right now. We look at the beachhead report, um, the, the approach, sorry, we're gonna show you the next slide. Um, talk about by 2030, we wanna electrify all the buses. Um, that's the only way we're gonna meet our 2040 goals. And so if you take a look here, it's so all transit buses and school buses by 2035. This was done by the Pemben Institute. And then by 20, 
by 2030 and by 2035, the medium heavy duty vehicles. And then by 2040, all of the um, your heavy duty trucks, uh, long range buses as well. And this is, the, if we can meet our emissions reduction targets by that. So how do we get there? There's a, a lot of really good ideas when you talk about turnkey solutions and P3s where you're offering, offering a full package of electric buses as well as, as uh, in infrastructure. You know, spending less on infrastructure, there's no reason to spend $300 million on a bus barn when you can actually do it for half the price or less. And it's a concept, if you take a look at this, the, uh, the, ice, uh, the three ice rinks here in, in uh, Calgary, where you have the bricks and mortar up front and the sprung structures in the back. And that allows you to really adapt to the future when technology changes, because we're not sure, Arjun mentioned about fusion, what's next? So we have to look at being, being different, looking at doing new solutions. <coughs> Um, we also have to build local, so create a new uh, zero emission bus economy, do that here in, in Alberta. And uh, use local supply chain. Just recently I read that Canada is leading the world in battery um, supply now. We're, apparently we're going to be building the most batteries in the world. That's fantastic, so we need to capitalize on it. Uh, we also have to change the way procurements are done. I mentioned that earlier, that in Europe it's an open market. Um, in Canada, it's uh, we want your electric bus, but we want it to have this seat, we want it to have this fabric, we want this window, all the different things that make it almost impossible to build that bus. And then the last thing I'll say is uh, don't quit. So sorry to run through that, but I wanted to get it done before any questions. So yeah, don't quit, please. You know, keep keep pushing forward. So. Any questions for Dad? Oh, this one there. Sorry, actually I have a question. She's just coming to... Sorry, she's just coming to you with the mic. We'll not be able to hear you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I have a question actually for the entire panel. Are you guys being able, no, more for the city of Edmonton, I guess, are you guys being able to benefit from the clean fuel regulations that have been applied since 2022, where you can get credits for replacing your normal combustion engines for electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles more clean, right? Loaded question. Um, I would say, are we benefiting? Yes. Is it to the extent that's required to be cost neutral? Not even close. So uh, uh, just to give you an example, um, diesel bus costs about 800000 A uh, fuel cell bu bus or uh, BEB in the Canadian market costs about $1.6 million. Now, depending on where the manufacturer is located, if you're not going with Nova, you're going with New Flyer, there's also currency changes um, that you have to look at as well. Now, the incentivization we have per bus is $8,000 a year. So it takes quite a while to fill that gap. The other piece is the variability of fuel costs. Diesel costs can fluctuate, you know, Russia, Ukraine, whatever but they don't fluctuate as much as you've seen your energy bill fluctuate over the last five or six years. So there's multiple things. Do the incentivizations help? Yes. Do we, are we still continuing to push uh, provincial governments, federal governments for more competition in the space, uh, for more incentivization programs? Absolutely. It's difficult downloading all of the tax burden onto homeowners in the Edmonton area because one dollar of property tax, or sorry, of one dollar of taxes collected, only about eight cents goes to your municipality. The rest are federal and provincial taxes that you pay. Um, so it's really important that we have other orders of government involved to help make the economic story better so we can adapt faster. Um, but as to Ted's point, with, with technology advancing, the, um, you know, Total cost of ownership model looks better and better every day. Ted, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just, uh, the, uh, just, that the, just that the zero emission transit fund covers 50% of the cost of the vehicle, and the cost of any infrastructure as well. And then CIB right now is lending um, less than 1% or 2%, very low. Hopefully, you're going to hear it. I don't need a um, have you done any look and study into the Milton Municipality conversion program where they have a company there that has converted buses and the price they quote is about 500000 so that'll make it 100000 less than a new diesel and over half the price of a new electric? Yes. 
Um, we can refurb a bus in the city of Edmonton for less than $150,000. We can do our dual fuel pilot um, for less than $100,000. The problem is, is that when you look at transition, you're not replacing body components. And so a 20-year-old bus, you can swap out the engine, you can put in batteries, you can swap out the engine, you can put in hydrogen fuel cells, et cetera. That stainless steel or composite structure is not being replaced at that time. There's other parts, and it, it gets silly, but nuts and bolts and washers and weird things that you have to now custom fabricate because they're no longer on the market. So there are some nuances and, and tricks in regards to refurbishing uh, or reutilizing existing buses. Is it a short-term stopgap solution? Absolutely. Is it a long-term sustainable solution? Probably not, because if you get down to replacing the stainless steel frames or the composite frames, et cetera, your costs are gonna escalate substantially. So what's being done right now in Milton, Ontario, all across Ontario, BC, et cetera, it's for municipalities that are unable to afford new buses. Uh, and so like you said, they're, they're spending one third or one half or whatever the ratio is to refurbish old buses as opposed to buying new. It's more of a fiscal problem uh, and a way to reutilize than it is an, an effectiveness efficiency problem. There's also safety considerations, right? Um, the engine failing or like the frame breaking while you're driving, you could kill people. Not so, great, no. Yeah, yeah. Crap. But no, there are ways to do it a lot cheaper, but they're generally refurbishing and it's not new technology. Newer frames are lighter weight, for example. Um, so, and Ted can talk about this, um, but if you put a battery propulsion system on a vehicle that weighs 5,000 pounds versus a vehicle that weighs 1,000 pounds, your efficiency, what you're able to get out of it, et cetera, amplifies in many orders of magnitude. I was just going to say, I know the company well that's doing it. And um, yeah, they have issued their price of say $500,000, but it doesn't qualify for the zero emission transportation fund. So you take, let's say you take a European bus, it's, it's 595,000 euros, let's say, that's almost a million dollars. And you drop that in half, it's 500,000. So it's it really, now you get a brand new bus, it's you know, going to last you 18 years. Um, whereas who knows how much, how long that 2008 bus is going to last in service. Could it be five years, six years? Nobody knows because of the structure. So, so if that's true and you're getting a brand new electric bus for the same price as a refurbished 20 year old bus, why aren't we seeing faster movement on this? Why aren't we seeing more conversion? Because like selling fleets to cities that don't have as much money is a common practice, right? Calgary sold a fleet to Winnipeg a number of years ago. So you could find it like they sold it for pennies on the dollar, but you're, that's still you getting rid of that fleet, and that's the reuse of the reduce reuse your cycle while you're getting this new fleet. So why do you think, in your opinion, are we not seeing a more rapid conversion for municipalities for for the conversion of the bus itself to electric, or just purchase electric? Do you think it's an infrastructure? Well, it's infrastructure is one of them, but also it comes down to the procurement side of it too. It takes a very long time from the time you put a bid out. It could take three years before you get the first bus delivered, and technology's changed. Look at prime, prime example is Pro, Proterra in uh, BC Transit. Bid was awarded in 2020. They they still haven't got their buses today, um, and then Proterra went bankrupt. So it's four years. So we need to streamline the procurement and look at P3s. How can we bring buses in and the whole package of energy storage, everything, to tackle that problem? And that's what they do in Europe now. And I'll just add to that. When, it, when we talk about supply chain, it's not just for battery electric vehicles or fuel cell. It's amplified there. But if I bought, order 10 waste trucks today or fire trucks today, I'm getting delivery times of up to 36 months with an order and payment today. So, and that's for regular diesel gasoline engines. Hi there, thanks everyone for your presentations today. Um, I work with a number of rural municipalities in Northern Ontario and the potential, we've been watching the pilots of bi-directional charging pretty closely and what that means for the total cost of ownership, especially on the, the light duty vehicle side. Haven't seen much with in, in respect to studies on what it might do to the, the total cost of ownership on the heavy, medium heavy duty side. I'm sure it's good as well, but just if you have any insight on any of reports or, or either statistics or numbers on that as well. 
I, I'm glad you asked because after you asked your previous question, I was like the other benefit of um, hub style charging for, you know, let's say a bus fleet is the ability to load share. So not even by, by di directional flow, but just load sharing across the fleet. So that is um, what's being implemented in the example I showed of um, tech with the minor shuttle buses. Twelve of them in the uh, bus garage. They've all got their chargers, but the load is managed across them so that you're um, efficient and in how you're, you're using that energy, right, and uh, getting the, the rate of charge that you need. Um, and then, yes, there are pilots right now on the uh, V to G um, side of things. Definitely pilots, <laughs> like it's, yeah. Um, but I think that is a huge opportunity, personally, and when we see issues like, um, you know, brownout warnings in <laughs> the province with extreme cold, um, what an opportunity that would have been um, for all of the capacity that's sitting not just in bus shelters, but um, driveways. Uh, this is something that I'm definitely watching closely from the um, residential side of things. I'm watching decibel out of Montreal, DCBEL, um, a new company that's uh, piloting that residential scale. And then, of course, um, oh, Power, who is it in Ontario that's doing it? Power. Peak, peak Power? I think it's Peak Power has their, um, yeah, their B to G pilot. And then uh, BC Hydro and Powertech Labs in British Columbia just uh, launched their um, pilot as well. I can't wait for that to be... Uh, <laughs> regulated for uh, commercial use in Canada, yeah. Do we have more questions? Okay. Um, all right. We'll have to keep this quick because uh, we've already exceeded our time by 11 minutes and we have another session coming in here. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is, so the mandates are that we're going to be selling zero emissions by 2040. That's fantastic. When will we see a reduction in those emissions. How long before the fleets are fully replaced, I guess, before everything on the road is actually that? O outside of, you know, the Ford Mustang that I need to have that's a 69 or whatever, right? But outside of those antiques and the classics, how long before we actually see full change? So a light duty fleet right now, Ford F-150, et cetera, in a commercial setting, your average life cycle is about eight years. Uh, for the city of Edmonton, your average bus life cycle uh, with our refurbishment program is 18 years of age. So it's a long time. So even if we're buying new, you're not going to buy new all at once as well because you want to you know, have your average age of the fleet at a certain level or you get um, really high operational costs later in the life cycle. So if you have a 1,000 unit fleet, for example, and your life cycle is 10 years, easy, easy numbers, you want to be replacing about 100 at a time over that 10 years. So your average maintenance cost and your average age stay similar. But we're decades away. Well, um, I think that's about it from questions. That's all we can take today. Uh, we couldn't even get to the panel discussion that we had planned, but it's great to know that we had uh, the audience participation. Everyone was so inquisitive. Thank you so much, Archon, Ted, and Megan, uh, for sharing your valuable insights and your time as well. Thank you. Just one last request from all of the audience here. We have a QR code here. If you could quickly scan it, we have a one-minute quiz on zero emission vehicles for you and a short survey that, once you fill in, will help us improve the content that we deliver on zero emission vehicles. So if you could please just take a minute or two and complete the survey and the one-minute quiz at the end of it. I would, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.